Krishna, thank you for coming tonight. My name is Vishwamitra Das, and um, I'm just going to speak a little bit about my limited experience, thank you, with Srila Prabhupada. Uh, like most of Srila Prabhupada's disciples, many of us had very little physical contact with Srila Prabhupada, especially when I joined um, in 1972. By that time, Prabhupada had become, uh, so many devotees had joined that it was very hard to get access to personal association with Srila Prabhupada. <laughs> we were always advised by the authorities not to bother Srila Prabhupada. And if you wa wanted a question asked, answered, you just asked the temple president and he would take care of it. So uh, consequently, many, many devotees that joined after 1972 had very little physical association with Srila Prabhupada. I had a little bit. But even a moment's association with Srila Prabhupada was very dynamic. Within a, a glance of Srila Prabhupada, you could learn volumes and you could, something to contemplate throughout your life. So I'll just go over a quick outline of how my experiences with Srila Prabhupada. <clears> the <throat> first time I met Srila Prabhupada was in September, September 30th of 1972. Um, I had just came back from Vietnam and uh, I was interested in self-realization because of all the turmoil that I had experienced in Vietnam. So I was looking for answers to questions such as, who am I, what am I doing here, why am I suffering, why is there so much killing going on? So when I was in Vietnam, I took a vow to answer these questions when I got out of the, of the army. So I, I started going to college and uh, studying philosophy and religion, and then I met the devotees. So I was coming to the temple uh, for a short time, and it, then I, Prabhupada was coming. That was uh, September 30th, 1972. I remember um, first Srila Prabhupada had gone to San Diego, California, which is about 100 miles, well, about 50 miles south of Laguna Beach. And uh, then he was coming north to Laguna Beach Temple. Now, somebody in San Diego had gotten this bright idea to paint Hare Krishna mantra on the steps as you entered the building, right? Um, so Prabhupada, when he went to San Diego, he refused to uh, go into the temple because he refused to step over the Maha Mantra. So they had to take him around to the back or the temple and bring him in that way in San Diego. So we got word of that in Laguna Beach. Somebody had already painted our steps with the Maha Mantra. So Prabhupada came, so immediately took him around to the Ramona Avenue entrance. And um, it was quite a, a pompous event. Um, I remember many, many devotees were there and there three or four devotees blowing conch shells. So I was all excited to see Srila Prabhupada. I always imagined that he was a very large man from a picture they had on the Vyasa sun. He looked very, very large. So I was quite surprised when Prabhupada entered the room and he was so small. I was like, wow, okay. <laughs> Prabhupada always surprised me, everything. You know, you, don't, you, can't, you can't understand Prabhupada or you can't, you can't um, imagine what he's gonna be like. So he walked into the room, and it, I'm sure you've probably heard this before. Many, many devotees have, have noticed this and seen this. Prabhupada seemed to be floating. He wasn't really walking. He kind of floated over to the Vyasasana and sat down. And in that meeting, uh, that was the first time he, he made the statement that there's many fallen yogis here in Laguna Beach. And he said, actually, there's many devotees here. But it seemed to, to me there was just a crowd of what we call karmis, right? But Prabhupada said, no, there's many devotees here. So Prabhupada was speaking and um, I remember he glanced at me. He, he looked at me and I'm sure you've heard this before. That Prabhupada, when he looked at you, he wasn't looking at your body. He wasn't looking at your mind. He was looking directly at your soul. And that's something that I had never experienced before, my own soul. So I had the realization that this man knows more about me than I know about myself. And I was a bit embarrassed because all the dirty little secrets <laughs> that I had were exposed. It was like the sunshine. 
So, <clears throat> um, the next time I saw him was in Los Angeles. And that was April 14th of 1973. So that was like less than a year. And the next time I saw him, uh, we drove up from Laguna Beach to LA uh, for a Srimad Bhagavatam class. And uh, Srila Prabhupada came out to greet the deities. I, I should probably add that after I saw Srila Prabhupada, the uh, temple president of Laguna Beach Temple, Rishabdev, uh, suggested that I do an experiment because I was a student at the time that had two weeks off during the Christmas period. Christmas vacation. So he suggested that I do an experiment, take two weeks, and just surrender for two weeks and see how you feel. See if you want to leave, you want to leave, you can leave. If you don't want to, you can stay. So I thought that sounded fair enough. So I did that. I took two weeks out of college and uh, I just tried my best to surrender wholeheartedly. So after those two weeks, of course, I never left again, right? School and everything like that was finished. That was history. <laughs> so the next time I saw Prabhupada, like I said, was April 14th of 1973, and that was in Los Angeles. And um, we would drive from the Laguna Beach Temple to Los Angeles, which was about mm, maybe an hour, hour and a half drive. So we would have Mangal at 4.30, 5 o'clock, everybody would jump in the van, and we would drive to Los Angeles. By the time we got there, of course, we chanted Japa on the way. By the time we got there, Prabhupada was coming back from his morning walk. So it was perfect timing. And then he would come out and greet, greet the deities. So Prabhupada uh, came out to greet the deities. And um, I was right there when he came out. And I bowed down. And uh, he stopped. And uh, I looked up. And he looked at me. And he didn't speak it with his mouth. but. I was really touched because he had remembered who I was from just a momentary encounter. He remembered exactly who I was and he said, oh, very nice, now you've joined us. And then he just walked on. So that was something I always remember. Um, at that time, I think Srila Prabhupada stayed in LA for about six weeks. I don't know if you remember Bhutama, was it? I think about six weeks he stayed there. So we did that for six weeks. We would drive from Laguna Beach to the LA temple, greet Prabhupada, hear Srimad Bhagavatam class, and then go out and distribute books the whole rest of the day. Drive back to Laguna Beach and do the same thing. We did that for six weeks. So that was really nice to hear Prabhupada speak Bhagavatam every day. And the way Prabhupada sang uh, Jaya Radha Madhava was just amazing. When Prabhupada would sing, there was ecstasy in the air, just waves of ecstasy flowing through the air. The devotees were just so much taken by Prabhupada in that way. Um, in 1973, September 8th, uh, I took initiation. Um, I took initiation at that time uh, via letter, and Kurandar performed the fire sacrifice. And um, that was first initiation. <clears throat> we used to go to the airport and pick Prabhupada up when he would arrive. So um, I remember um, distributing books for, oh gosh, I guess it was a year and a half, something like that. And uh, I was thinking to myself, well, Prabhupada's coming to the airport. He's going to be very proud of me when he sees me because I've been doing really nice service. Distributing a lot of books, being very strict. So I was thinking Prabhupada's going to smile and really bless me, you know. So when Prabhupada came out of the airplane, I remember I had bowed down and I sat up and looked up and he looked at me and he looked at me with such disgust that I felt about that tall. I felt so humbled. I could not understand why. Why is Prabhupada disapproving of me so much? I've done so much nice service. <laughs> Such a fool, right? And later I understood it took me, because I'm so dull, it took me a long time to understand that Prabhupada was telling me that pride ruins everything. If you become proud of your devotional service and thinking you're doing something on your own merit, it really ruins the whole mood, the whole feeling. 
So it took me a long time to understand that, but hopefully I've understood it now. <clears throat> but when, when we would go to the airport, we would try to race back to the temple before Prabhupada could get there, right? We meet him at the airport, walk through the airport, he would get in his limousine, and then all the devotees would run for the vans, jump in the vans and race back to the temple, running red lights, everything. <laughs> Figured, hey, it's for Krishna, right? No problem. So we would get back to the temple and then greet Prabhupada as he arrived at the temple. He'd come into the temple. Um, next time I saw uh, Srila Prabhupada was in Laguna Beach, it was July 26, 1975. And Prabhupada stayed there, I think it was for a few days. He stayed at uh, a devotee named Ratna Naba. He had a house right next door to the temple. And at that time when Prabhupada came, there was a big controversy going on. There was a Robin George case, right? I don't know if you've, you're familiar with that. But it was a case where a young girl had come and joined the temple. <clears throat> I think she was 16 years old, something like that. And... Um, she wanted to stay in the temple, um, but there was some, some problem with her being underage and her not having her parents' permission. But she begged the devotees, please do not send me home. When I chant Hare Krishna, my father puts a garden hose down my throat. She even said something like he handcuffed her to the sink or the, the toilet in the bathroom. So she was begging the devotees not to send her home. So at that time, Jayatirtha was a GBC in Los Angeles. So she was able to convince him to give her shelter. So he shipped her to another temple. Well, eventually the, the, um, the parents got involved, the police got involved. It was a kidnapping case, it was a big court case and all that. Anyhow, her parents were on the sidewalk outside the temple protesting with picket signs about how the Hare Krishnas are <clears throat> kidnapping her children and so on and so forth. <clears throat> And Prabhupada was there at the same time. So um, because I'd had some military training, the devotees asked me to guard Prabhupada and gave me a 45 pistol. So I was able to stay in the room with Prabhupada during darshans with the pistol in, in my dhoti <laughs> in case anything happened because this man was really quite violent. And uh, let me see if there's much else I have to say. Next time was um, March 1976 in Mayapur, Mayapur Festival. Uh, Radha Damodar Party, we were <clears throat> many, many brahmacharis in Radha Damodar Party. We had chartered a plane from New York. I'm not sure what size it was. It wasn't a 747, maybe just a bit smaller. We chartered a plane, and uh, the whole plane was all devotees. So we were having kirtan and prasadam. It was really, really a, a, a real festival inside. Um, so at that time, uh, I took Brahman initiation from Srila Prabhupada in his room in Mayapur. And that was a one-on-one -on -one situation with Srila Prabhupada. And once again, I had not learned my lesson from that encounter at the Los Angeles airport about being so puffed up about service and such. So I was thinking, boy, Prabhupada's going to probably ask me some pretty esoteric questions. Because I've been doing this for a long time now. I mean, what are we talking, three years? <laughs> you know, so uh, I went in to see Prabhupada, and Prabhupada had his eyes closed the whole time. And uh, I paid my obeisances, and I was thinking, and Prabhupada said, So, are you chanting 16 rounds? And I thought to myself, Well, that's very elementary. I got that down a long time ago. And I said, Yes, Prabhupada. And are you following the four regular principles? I said, Yes, Prabhupada. He said, Okay, fine, come here whispered the Gayatri in my ear, put the thread on, I was gone. So that's basically my association with Srila Prabhupada. Very, very little physical association. Most of uh, my relationship with Srila Prabhupada was developed in a parking lot, praying to him to help me distribute his books. So it hasn't changed much for me. Now I still pray to him. And because uh, there was not much physical contact, there's not much difference now and then. So that's my association with Srila Prabhupada. Thank you very much for listening. Hare Krishna. Slip in. 
Hare Krishna, my name is Bhutatma Das, and um, I'll take a, try and take about the same amount of time uh, to give some accounts. <coughs> uh, I first encountered Srila Prabhupada in 19, uh, might have been 69 or something, through his uh, essays, uh, Who is Crazy and Reservoir of Pleasure. They'd been printed up in a black and white little uh, pamphlet. And so uh, I read one of those, or read that, those two essays. And uh, at that time, of course, I was seeking spiritually. I'd read Paramahansa Yogananda's book and others and so forth. And uh, it was kind of the thing among all my friends and community of friends. We were searching and you know, we got to the point where India was uh, the center of spiritual knowledge. And so I read those pamphlets and immediately felt, well, this, I found my guru. You know, this is exactly the way it is. Uh, so sometime after, I joined in Laguna Beach Temple. And uh, probably was not in the U.S. at that time. Uh, so the first time I came in his physical association was when he came to the uh, Ra Theatre in San Francisco, 1971. I'd never seen him before uh, physically, so it was quite striking, as Vishwamrita probably mentioned, and so many devotees have, uh, you know, probably just kind of glided off the plane. Actually, I read in the fourth canto where it says that uh, personalities from Svarga Loka and above uh, retain their weightlessness when they come to Earth. Um, Although Krishna, in that narration, did touch the earth, you remember? Although he held on to Garuda, <laughs> because he's not used to it. And uh, so Prabhupada seemed to walk on the earth, but he did retain his weightlessness. In fact, once I was involved in lifting him up with another devotee, and it was like shocking. He was like a feather. He just floated. It was almost like he wanted to <laughs> not let him float away. Um, so that was the first time I, s I saw him at the airport, and then... <clears throat> he came for the Rathiatra, he came for the Rathiatra. So uh, Kesha was the president there, I was the vice president, so we decided to be the bodyguards, that way we could stay really close with him all the times, right? So we were able to walk right next to him because that was our self-designated position of bodyguards. Um, although Kesha was very confident to do it, me less so, but, but that was very nice because through the whole thing we were just walking right next to him and and so that was great relish. And um, I remember the lecture he gave, he talked a very, uh, basically he talked about the verse where Krishna says, I'm the light of the sun and the taste of the water. And at that time those festivals were huge. Uh, in fact, I remember the next year, just throw this out as kind of a illustration of it. The following year when we had it, <coughs> we had a kirtan in Golden Gate Park I remember Sukadeva Prabhu led it. Really ecstatic kirtan went on and on. Jayananda Prabhu was just kind of swooning in bliss. With, you know, he was so happy. And there was like thousands of people chanting on and on. It must have, it's like a 45 minute hour kirtan. And then it was over, did the Jayom. And literally like 5,000 people were on the ground doing the Jayom prayers. It was like that. So at that time, that festival, there was so much energy. So probably came and um, <clears throat> gave the lecture. And then afterwards, he was staying in Berkeley. And uh, I remember <laughs> someone had called and said, probably need, want some dried mangoes. So we had a, a, you know, a little Hare Krishna card. It actually had the mantra on the side, right? It's a little Ford Maverick, <laughs> white, old. Well, now they don't make it, but it was just a compact Ford. But we had painted, you know, Hare Krishna mantra on the door. So, okay, I rushed down, got the mangoes, dried mangoes, and I'm driving across the Oakland Bay Bridge. And I must have been doing about 90. You know, I was just like oblivious. Just, mm. And a policeman stopped me. He said, what are you doing? You know? <laughs> and I go, I have to get these mangoes to my spiritual master. <laughs> and he looks at me, I'm in full regalia and everything. I'm, I guess I was pretty sincere, but I said, well, okay, go ahead. <laughs> He goes, just don't do 90 miles an hour on the bridge anymore, right? Uh, so I brought those there, and, and that, was, that was sweet. And we actually, I got to cook for Prabhupada that time. I'm not a cook, 
but uh, I kind of finagled it, uh, and uh, so with, uh, occasionally we cooked uh, Prabhupada's meal that time. It was sweet for me because when it was over, Prabhupada was there, and he said, uh, Prabhupada ate everything. He says, he never really, rarely does that. So I was very, you know, very happy about that. <laughs> Although there were no remnants on the plate, just scraped a little sauce or something. Um, let's see. I keep this in some kind of chronology. <clears throat> um, Prabhupada spent a lot of time in Los Angeles. I was fortunate in that respect because I'd become a temple president in San Francisco and uh, Karandar, who was GBC in West Coast and he was stationed in LA. Uh, you know, he was kind of the decider of things like who went on morning walks and stuff. So. I was very, you know, very close friends with him. So I would make a point uh, to be in LA as much as I could, all kinds of reasons. Sometimes I'd go down and do Sankirtan even, and, and stay there, uh, because he would let me go on the walks. Um, Venice Beach, Chevy Hills, you're all familiar with those walks. Maybe some of you went on them. Um, but those were really wonderful. I remember very early on, uh, <clears throat> The first time I went on a walk, <laughs> you know how you are, I was only maybe 21, 20 years old or something. Uh, and you know, there were senior devotees there, you know, and uh, Srip Dhamma used to speak a lot with Prabhupada. Prabhupada was comfortable talking to him, he liked the Baish, the scientists, and so Srip Dhamma was kind of the, the main conduit for Prabhupada smashing them, right? Boot on the face. Um, but I, you know, I had one to ask a question, you know, I thought, okay, you know. Uh, just to interact, right? Human nature. But I was a little intimidated. I hadn't really done that before. And, um, you know, we were younger than a lot of the senior devotees. And not only they'd been in the movement a few years longer, but they were often five, six years older. And at that age, that's a big gap, right? They're pretty mature. And you're, so, um, anyway, I decided, probably was talking about animal killing and stuff, so I thought, well, here's a chance, I'll ask him a question. So I said, well, Prabhupada, do animals uh, have a sense that they're going to die? Because traditionally we think of humans, that's a distinction, right? We know we have, we're mortal. Animals, does it occur to them? So I assumed it didn't. And uh, he gave an interesting answer. He said when they're about to be killed, like a cow, he said they can sense it. So they don't know intellectually, but when they're near death, they can sense it. So he went right to that, and uh, and he really took time. I mean, he looked right at me and stopped the whole walk and turned to me. So it was a great sense of reassurance for me, not just getting the question answered, but a sense that, uh, you know, that he takes you seriously a little bit as a person. And so that was very a very nice moment for me, uh, even though it's... For others, it may seem uh, you know, insignificant. For me personally, it was it was something uh, that I remember. Um, and then speaking about mentioned a little about the temple. Just one of the greatest things was coming back into the temple. So there usually be a half dozen people on the walk. So when you get out of the the, the cars, sometimes there'd be two cars, but <clears throat> and walk into the temple. Probably always timed it. You know, he wasn't. Uh, how we say spaced out <laughs> at all. I mean, he knew the time, he could feel it, he knew it, and he would say, you know, get back there just right at the, right at the moment. It was uncanny. So anyway, we come, LA Temple was, um, it was in the smaller area at that time, the smaller room, before they re, you know, restructured or redesigned the bigger room. So we come in this way, and I just remember how many days you know, whether you were there waiting for him, or, but I don't know, when you walked in with him, you just felt all the devotees there just waiting for Prabhupada, right, to, uh, to arrive, and all the uh, energy of, uh, of anticipation, everything, welling up, and then the deity doors opening up was really one of the grandest experiences, you know, and then Prabhupada would come in, and everyone would be, you know, ecstatic and so forth. I mean, Prabhupada's presence just made everyone ecstatic. It was like nothing else. I mean, people were going just uh, in bliss just to be around him. 
Um, so those are very nice, nice moments. Um, uh, there was, in that same time frame, uh, kind of running late, I guess, but in that same time frame, um, as I said, I was in San Francisco as the president there, and I wanted Prabhu to come up and visit. It wasn't a Rathiatra time or anything. And so Shama Sundar was his secretary at LA right then. And as I said, I was younger, and sometimes you don't think about things in the way you might when you're a little bit older and know the world better. So I was kind of scratching my head, you know, so how can I get Prabhu to come up there? And Shama Sundar says, well, just have some preaching programs. You know, Prabhu's a preacher, you know. I was like, oh, duh, you know, <laughs> that's a good idea. So I was able to set up two, program, <clears throat> two programs at that time, which I'll mention briefly. Uh, and of course, Baba came up for them. So the first one was in Golden Gate Park. They had a building uh, called the Hall of Flowers. And it was a beautiful building. It, uh, it was all glass. But yet it was set up for presentations and so we had a stage and you know you could bring chairs in there and it would ho house a couple hundred people easily. So um, I arranged to have Prabhupada give us a lecture there. And we would do a program. So we advertised it, you know, as you would do. So finally the day comes and Prabhupada flies up and um, you know, we're arranging everything, and <clears throat> we had a nice car for him. I remember you know, saying, probably we have this car, this is your car. And he said, near Mana Moha, nothing is mine, right? <laughs> uh, and kind of laughed, you know. But anyway, for the program, so he came and, and gave a wonderful lecture. And I remember I had a, um, and there's a devotee in L.A. who always makes a big deal of this because he, he came, he hadn't joined yet. But we had, I don't know if they still use them, they're, they're like the Peacock fans, but with the long handle. So I was fanning Prabhupada, it was about from here to, to Smarter Hari, fanning with that. And this devotee always tells that how it, it just blew him away, the whole scene. But it was really, really wonderful, you know, and Prabhupada's on the Vyasa san, and everyone's like in rapt attention. I remember one devotee had gone around Vesal and put tilak on everyone in the audience, you know. <laughs> so Prabhupada looked out, it was a, 300 people with T-Lock on. And um, it was just really a sweet program. And we passed out uh, what we were doing on Sankirtan. We went to Berkeley. We came up with the idea to have a little, you know, I remember thinking, we'd, sometimes we'd take out prasadam and people, well, you give them, you know, halava, it's a little this and that. So we came up with the idea, just give them popcorn, right? Because that's very handy. Everybody likes popcorn, easy to eat. So we made up these little Hare Krishna bags and we get popcorn. It was perfect, right? People love. Who's not going to take a little bag of popcorn? So we did that at this uh, event also. So everybody got. It. I remember when it was over. I wanted Prabhu to have some, so I brought out. Chanda was going to drive him back. He was staying across the bay of the house that uh, the devotee had there. So he was going to drive him back in. in actually, it was his father's car, kind of a fancy big car. So I came out and uh, I gave Prabhupada, I said, Prabhupada, we're giving these to all the guests, prasad and popcorn. So he took it. And then Chandan told me when he went back, when he got back, he'd, he'd eaten all of it. You know? And one thing, I don't know, this may be inappropriate to say, but uh, he, uh, Chandan told me they were talking. I feel a little funny saying this, but uh, it's kind of, Boastful, maybe I don't. Know. But um, you know, there's probably saying it's a really nice program, and I really enjoyed. It. He's you know, Tom did a really good job, and uh, Oshana was going to talk, and probably said, yes, he's a very good boy. And so when Chanda told me that, I don't know about you, but that meant a lot. So like, <laughs> I'm not a demon, perhaps, you know. Come back to so, so I felt pretty good about that one. But excuse me if it's boastful, but. Um, so we went back to the house, and Prabhupada was there by then. And it was really interesting because we taped it on a reel to reel, and so Prabhupada wanted to hear the whole thing. So we played the kirtan first. In fact, he mentioned there was one devotee who played nice harmonium, and he asked me, who's the, playing the harmonium? It's very nice. And so I told him, and then we listened to the whole lecture. And then it was over, Prabhupada 
uh, got the Mridanga and led samsara prayers. And so that was really a, a sweet occasion. And then the next night, I arranged a, uh, I'd gotten to know one professor at UC Berkeley. Those from the States know Berkeley is one of the very top schools in the US, even in the world. And so I knew this one professor, uh, Mark Jurgensmeyer, who was a little bit new in the faculty there. But also in the faculty was uh, Dr. Stahl. I don't remember his first name now. But you, you guys remember that pamphlet, the Conversations with Dr. Stahl. They printed it because it probably had, had a series of letter exchanges with Dr. Stahl, who was a Sanskrit professor at Berkeley. And it was about, you know, the authenticity of Lord Chaitanya's chanting, that sort of thing. It was very respectful, but it was a little bit of a debate. And so they printed it as kind of a little scholarly pamphlet. <clears throat> so anyway, we arranged this program uh, I did through uh, Professor Jurgensmeyer. And I wasn't sure how many would come. You know, it wasn't like RSVP or anything. So we'd gone there and set up a, a you know, a, a table of sorts. And we put the Vyasa on on it. Not a, it wasn't a huge one, but it was a Vyasa song. And so, you know, we're coming into the building, and it was like Berkeley, if, you, if you've ever been there, it's kind of older wooden buildings, you know. So, I don't know, just being a little foolish, I said to probably that, you know, these buildings are kind of old. And he looks, because we don't care about the buildings, you know. And uh, kind of laugh. So we go inside, and as he starts, he's looking around, and it turned out about, 40 professors and their wives came. So it was like, for that kind of academic meeting, it was really packed. And uh, probably you could see we walked in, he was really pleased, right? A big turnout. And you know, he liked preaching to, to those intellectuals. And, and so he sat there and the first thing he says, is he's looking around and he says, oh, I see the famous Dr. Stahl has come, right? <laughs> and of course, he's just so charmed, he's almost, you know, uh, so happy that Prabhupada acknowledged him and everything. And then he gave a really wonderful talk. He talked a lot about the Varnashram. I remember after the lecture, he was taking questions, and I was sitting there with the Shrub Damodar and Pradyum the Prabhu and myself. And then one professor asked, they were talking about Brahmins, and he goes, So are these uh, your devotees Brahmins? And I was wondering what's Prabhupada going to say. And he looked and he goes, uh, They're becoming Brahmins. <laughs> And uh, which was very, I think, appropriate because, you know, they're going to be uh, very astute about that. So um, uh, we gave that, and on the way back, Prabhupada was really happy. He, he told me, he says, this was a very important meeting. So that was very, very nice to hear. And uh, uh, so that was his trip to San Francisco. And... Uh, Oh, I was going to mention one other, I think it's kind of a nice story, on the Venice Beach Walks. Um, I'd grown up in Southern California and grown up surfing. That was the time for it. And just lived at the beach as a young man right up till the time I joined. So once we were walking on Venice Beach, and I happened to be next to Prabhupada, and you know how the waves come in. They have kind of the crashing waves, and then they recede. And it makes kind of a... A little bit of a sad sound. And so, you know, being a surfer, I was very attuned to all that, listening to the surf, and I knew that sound very well. And Prabhupada turned to me as it was receding, kind of that mournful sound when the waves go out, and he turned to me and said, this is the sound of the gopis sign for Krishna, right? Which I thought was really uh, pretty moving, and also kind of really tied in to a lot of things that I had been familiar with. Um, so that was, uh, that I had, let's see, so I don't need that, let me, some of these I can skip, it's getting kind of late. Um, okay, real quickly, I'll do, I'll just do a couple more. Well, you should speak till 6.30. No, no, I, I just, about five more minutes, I just have a couple no, more, some I don't need to, need to do. Um, if I get this straight, see which one's on. Okay, I can get this to hold. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, the, the, uh, in Los Angeles he had his quarters there, a lot of 
wonderful times there because it was a beautiful room and he would speak. I was also, like Vishnuri, able to get my Gayatri uh, from Prabhupada. Um, I was still a pretty new devotee, actually. I think only about eight months in the movement. Uh, but, you know, that time, I was temple president, I had to be a Brahmin. <laughs> so, uh, I remember Prabhupada, uh, so he, I was just in a room with Keshva. He was the one who, who recommended me. And so, um, Prabhupada talked to us a long time. It was really, really nice. In fact, he told me, he said, you should, uh, <laughs> Keshva should be your advisor. He goes, he's very good at giving advice. And Keshva got a big smile and stuff and everything. And so then I went over to get the thread. Of course, I almost knocked the lamp over, you know, getting there. But it was kind of interesting because Prabhupada showed me how to count. But he did it really fast. He goes, like that. You know, how the whole... And then he looks at you, so you have it? Show me, right? And I was like, I, I don't know what happened. I was a blur, you know? And so I did it, one, two, three, and I did it right. And he looked at me like, okay, very good. <laughs> You're not a complete... But he was kind of playing with me, I think. But Krishna gave me the intelligence somehow to remember where he touched his hand. And then uh, maybe the last one I'll, I'll tell is um, in Mayapur. Uh, Gargamuni had mentioned, I don't know if any of you came, about taking the vans and driving the vans from Germany to Mayapur and these six Mercedes vans, which Prabhupada was so happy to get. And they went to great use. He'd come down, as Gargamini said, he came with the vans, and Prabhupada jumped up, almost ran down the stairs and got in the vans and was saying, I'll go with you. It was really nice. <clears throat> and we told him all the things that happened. He was, seemed to be enthralled with it, right? Uh, so that was really wonderful, you know. And as I mentioned, he, when we were done, he said, yes, Krishna wanted you to have those adventures, you know. And he was like, really? You know, everything, we're talking about the fuel separating, and he was really enjoying it. I think he liked it when his devotees were a little bold and, you know, took some danger for Krishna. It was dangerous. I mean, there were trucks on the side of the road all the way along, had fallen off and stuff. But, uh, so, one of those darshans at that time, um, I was in the darshan, I happened to be sitting real close to Prabhupada like that, and a lot of Indians had come. There were, seemed to be 30 or 40. It was like, a, for some reason, there was a big group of Indians. So Prabhupada was speaking. This kind of ties into one thing he <laughs> said. You know, Prabhupada was speaking about different things, and he was talking about, like, you know, his eyeglass cleaner, how it's this little tissue, and it only, you know, costs a little to make, and they charged five rupees. And I was, I happened to be saying things, you know, in response to that, you know, like, yes, that's, they're so in, interested in making profits, and so it was going on a little like that. So, uh, you know, I was kind of honestly feeling like, man, it's pretty good, you know. Uh, you know, I'm making some good comments, because he seemed to really be <laughs> acknowledging everything I was contributing, you know. I feel like, oh, all these Indians were there. And then, you know, all of a sudden, prop, you know, since my head's getting a little big, I guess, he just kind of turned and looked at me. Like, you know, just a look, like, to me, it was like, you know, no, no, no. <laughs> Don't let your false ego, you know, get the best of you. And, and then he just looked back. So I just shut up because I felt, mm. And I felt really bad, though. It really went to my heart, you know. It's one of those things where you're riding high, and then your ego gets in, and then, boom, I just felt almost depressed. And so the next morning... We had this, uh, you know, Prabhupada would circumambulate with the devotees around the deities, right? And then at the one point, he would stop, and there was a bell, and he would ring that bell in time with the kirtan. Dang, dang. And of course, it's just like open the box, everybody's going crazy and chanting. And I was still feeling a little bad, but I was chanting, and you know, it was like kind of a mix, like an orange, sweet and sour, right, at the same time. I was feeling blissful, but yet it was still nagging me a little. And so I'm chanting, chanting, and Prabhupada was pretty close. He turned and looked right at me, you know, just looked in my eyes, dead. And, you know, he was in ecstasy. You could see it. His eyes were just in me, ecstasy. And then, you know, I, I just looked at him, because he's looking at me, 
and all of a sudden I felt this wave of like this, you know, everything. Don't worry about it. It's nothing. Just take the mercy, you know. And honestly, when I looked in his eyes there, I felt the thought I had because they were just honestly full of ecstasy. I felt like this is the gateway to the ocean of bliss. I mean, that was the thought I had, you know, right through <coughs> Prabhupada, his consciousness on the Krishna. It's unlimited. It was just pouring out. And um, so that was uh, a really wonderful moment, which, which I'll, uh, of course, never forget. Um, all right, I'll just uh, end there. Uh, yeah. Bhutapha Prabhu is a professor at a California University. He's highly intelligent, and he was uh, a staff member, contributor for uh, Hare Krishna, one of the first newspapers we had, Hare Krishna paper. And also he compiled many of the small books that we have, like the Science of Self-Realization and so many of the small Coming books. Up. Could you say something about this, about the importance of books and about the... Uh, well, Prabhupada wanted that. The first book we did was, uh, this was in L.A. in the 80s, was Coming Back, because Prabhupada asked for that book. He wanted a book on reincarnation. So along with... Uh, with, with Rameshwar and Makunda, we uh, put together that. And uh, it's, I see it's still around today. And I think that's because Prabhupada wanted it. So, you know, there were different ideas. We came up with the idea of put some of the stories from the Bhagavatam in there, along with, you know, our summaries of points of, re of reincarnation. I don't know if you've ever, if you've ever seen the book, but it's like different chapters about consciousness and so forth. <coughs> and then, um, yeah, we did the higher taste and... Um, that kind of came out of a conversation with Bhadra Devi Dasi in the <laughs> Govinda's restaurant because uh, she's a cook. She's a, cook. she's a great cook. Yeah, she did the recipe. So I was talking with her. She cooks for Madonna when Madonna comes to Los Angeles. Yeah, she's a great cook. So that kind of grew out of that conversation, in fact. Um, and then the Origins magazine was with Sadhapuda. And uh, Chant Be Happy, of course, was the based on the George Harrison interview, which Makunda went and got. It was kind of funny because he got the interview. It was really long. And he typed it all up. And then he and I were going over it and um, editing it down. And so I'm at the apartment there. And um, so George Harrison, you know, we'd send him the edited version for his approval. And so I'm at the apartment. And all of a sudden, the phone rings, hello. He goes, yeah, this is George Harrison. <laughs> so I, I said, not a lot of people did he call him. So then we went over the whole manuscript. And so he approved everything? He approved. Oh, he was into it. We spent three hours after he had spent all the time with his changes going over his changes. Wow. He was very into it. He liked wow. it, yeah. We spent three hours on the phone, then we had to send him that one. But that was all right. So that book and uh, so forth, yeah. But that was a nice... Uh, opportunity. But in San Francisco, we actually, um, I believe it's fair to say, uh, it wasn't me, but uh, some other devotees really were the first ones to distribute the big books there. They went out. And well, were uh, you on the first traveling? Yeah, party? first party from San Very Francisco. first traveling Sanctum party in the yeah. whole world. Well, Francisco. I don't know, you know if that's true. We don't that's have true. those that's kinds true. of records. That's but true. Was it It wasn't Keshava. He was there. It was really, um, uh, uh, it was um, Buddhi Mantu was one and, and uh, Vishwarita. They just kind of did it by chance. You know, we had all those Krishna books and we were kind of stewing our heads. And they went out and they sold them. So then, of course, we got the strategy and it went going and boy, what a difference. You know, and then you look back at the letters of Prabhupada and you see how he was, you know, hinting at it, hinting at it. It's like, finally we did it. And it's like, you know, he was, and of course everybody knows, knows that history. But that was pretty good, uh, pretty good time. We, everything just exploded with book distribution. And all the fun started coming what in too. Was that? that was, I think, 72, I think. 72. Yeah, I, was, I remember about 72. We'd never, you know, we always went out and did BTGs and, that was it. That's for the public. You know, if somebody's really serious, you try and sell them a book. 
All of a sudden we found out, no, you can sell these. And you know, Prabhupada's paintings were the reason. He'd show them those paintings, and that's what he wanted with that art. He wanted to use that art to attract people to the philosophy, you know. And it was so stunning, and then, well, $10, whatever it was. And so and we just went crazy. Done that. Yeah, that helped, you know. It was like all waiting to happen, you know. It was just sitting there. And Prabhupada's waiting, come on, guys, wake up. And then almost by chance, it seemed. Because they didn't even go out with a plan. They just had one, I think, in their book bag and got... I bought it. It's like, hey, we can sell these to people. Could he imagine him do plans Huh? Could he imagine it? Very spontaneous. Oh, he was, he was crazy, yeah. And he was, I mean, in a good yeah. way. You know, he was wild, yeah. Everywhere. I remember seeing Budimanta selling a book. We went to Tankerton, and honest to God, the lady didn't want it. Budimanta was on his, on his knees with the book. And he only had that, his face is all red. He's like, Please. He was not somehow, and she bought it. You know, that's how intense he was. He was super intense, but for the right reasons. Uh, so before I step down, any any, any questions? Anyone? Comment? Uh, original. The offended. Uh, yeah. Subject. What subject do I teach? What subject do I teach? Uh, I teach in the Department of Political Science. We're not going to go there. <laughs> I don't talk to anybody about politics. <laughs> because uh, that's, everybody's got strong opinions. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much, Prabhu. Uh, Thank you, Hare Krishna. Pancha Kalpa, Tarubyascha, Kripa Sindhu Bhayevacha, Patit Pavan, Pavnevyo, Vaishnavevo, Namona Maha, Jai Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhupada, Sri Advaita Gadadhar Sivasari Gorbhakta Vrinda, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. In my view, there is as many Krishnas as there are devotees because each devotee has their own unique relationship with Krishna. So I said there's that many Krishnas. Just like a father with various children, the children have different relationships with him. What to speak of his co-workers, his colleagues, his servants, his driver, the postman, that he has different, different relationships. Similarly, my view is that there are as many Srila Prabhupada's as there were devotees relating to Srila Prabhupada. Of course there was one Srila Prabhupada but he had many many different aspects which various devotees uncovered or related to him in a particular way. And I find it's just wonderful to hear different individual devotees understanding and relationships and memories and things that struck them and so on and so on. It's just every time a devotee speaks of his interaction and his memories of the interaction of Srila Prabhupada, I find something new and something, an aspect, a facet of Srila Prabhupada that was um, unknown to me. Um, Srila Prabhupada was just amazing. He, we were young, young boys. I joined when I was 18. Um, just very, very young, naive. I had never voted. I had never attended a wedding. I had all the social functions. I had never done these things. Just very, very naive, very, very. And uh, so many devotees seem to be so much uh, more experienced worldly, educated, so many different things than I was. But it was interesting to see how different people were relating to Srila Prabhupada. Um, I said to one god sister, she and her husband were visiting, I was living in London, 
she and her husband were visiting on the way to India and they stayed at my home and at one point I said to her, I said, I've always admired you because you're very enthusiastic. And she laughed and she said, one time Srila Prabhupada was visiting Los Angeles. One time Prabhupada Srila Prabhupada was visiting Los Angeles and she was on Sankirtan and she was very enthusiastic and she went and she had so many books that she was going to give out and very quickly she gave out the, whole, the books and she came back and she went right into Srila Prabhupada's room in Los Angeles and he was sitting, he had some guests, there were six or eight people speaking, educated people and Indian people and so many different, Prabhupada was speaking very nicely to them and he gave an example about how our best interest is to serve Krishna. So he said, just like the hand cannot enjoy the food, but if he, and she said, yes, if, if the hand, if you take the hand and you, 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 you give food to the stomach, then the stomach, everyone, be, and she finished the whole example. <laughs> and Sri Baba just looked at her. And then he continued, he was speaking, and then he gave another example. And she said, yeah, yeah, j just like, and she took over the whole thing and she explained to everybody what was there. And Prabhupada looked at her and she realized what she'd done twice. And Prabhupada said to the people, he said, just see how enthusiastic she is. <laughs> so Srila Prabhupada, he was very expert at dealing with people. And I think he was a little kinder to the, some of the girls than he was to some of the boys. The boys were... Uh, he was uh, very, very expert at dealing with people. When Giriraj Maharaj, as a brahmachari, was in Bombay, and he was doing very nice service there. And he was one of the team who manifest the whole Juhu, Iskand Juhu project. Giriraj Maharaj said that as a small boy, he was, uh, his father would take him with him to different, they lived in Chicago. His father was wealthy, his father was a corporate lawyer, and he was a millionaire, which was a very big deal in those times. Now your house can be worth a million. But it was very rare and it was a very big deal to be a millionaire in those days. His father was a millionaire from his own business enterprises. He was a corporate lawyer advising companies, tax law and so many things. As well as that, he was additionally wealthy because he was one of the uh, CEOs of American Steel, which at the time was the biggest steel company in the whole world. Now it's probably Mittal or one of the big steel conglomerates, but American Steel was selling the steel for the ships all over the world, a big, big, big company. So he was additionally wealthy from this. So he explained to his son, Giriraj, that he felt that his huge success was on account of being able to deal with people appropriately. He felt this is the whole secret of success to deal with people properly. And as a small boy, the father would stop, he would watch the exchange between the lady paying for the taxi and the taxi driver. And he would say to his son, she's not dealing with him properly. That was, you know, he, he, he would sense that, he would point out that there was a flaw in the way she dealt. Or different things, he would stop and he would tell him because he felt that if his son could deal with people properly, then he would be, become very successful. So perhaps this worked because Giraj Maharaj was a, a wonderful preacher. I was going out with him on different occasions. Um, he came to London a few years ago and I said, looking back, one of my regrets in life is that I didn't spend more time with him and learn more from him because he is just a wonderful, wonderful communicator. Anyhow, at some point, the father and the mother, they told him they were coming to Bombay to meet him and they wanted to speak to Srila Prabhupada. So he advised Prabhupada on a traveling schedule and so on, but he will be in Bombay at this particular time. So they flew in 
from Chicago and came to see Srila Prabhupada. Um, Prabhupada had them in, gave them chairs, very nice to them. He said, uh, where is Giriraj? And they said, Prabhupada, he's uh, out seeing a few people, but, uh, and Prabhupada said, inform me when he returns. He said, okay. So he was talking to the father, to the mother, and so on. So the father said, he said, let me get to the point. He said, I'm getting old. And he said, I want my son to come back home and to run the business. And he reached into his pocket and he had a check. And he put the check from his checkbook on Srila Prabhupada's table. He said, this is a signed blank check. He said, I'm a rich man. And he said, a very honorable man. He said, you please write whatever amount you want on that check. He said, I will honor the check, but I want my son to come back. Prabhupada said, okay. And he was talking about different things. Then they told him, Giraj has come. Prabhupada said, tell him, tell him to come. So his car pulled in and he just immediately came up, paid his obeisances. Srila Prabhupada said, your father has explained to me that he wants you to go home and run the family business. He said he is getting old, he wants to retire, he wants it to be in the hands of someone he trusts. He said he has offered me a blank check. He said, your father tells me I can put any amount I want on the check. He said he said that he is a very rich man but a very honorable man, and he will honor the check, whatever I, whatever amount I put in. He said, what do you want to do? Kirat said, Srila Prabhupada, I want to stay here, I want to serve you, I want to finish the project, I want to, you know, he let him speak for some time. Just. So he said to his father, he said, you have heard his decision, and with a finger he push the check a couple of inches back to. So that evening, a lot of people were intrigued to meet Giraj's father. And also whenever Srila Prabhupada was in town, many people would come and see him. The whole Bombay crowd, um, industrialists and intellectuals and Sanskrit people and different. The Prabhupada there was a crowd and they liked to argue with Prabhupada and Prabhupada would better them and so on and so on. So it was one of those evenings and of course Srila Prabhupada, so his father was there, the mother, they were. And then after some time the secretary said, it's um, Srila Prabhupada, he's, during the night he, he, he translates and uh, he takes a little rest now and he gets up at one and he translates for, you know, until six and he said, so we need to finish now and he's gone to, so told everyone to go. So they went out to the outer room and uh, Giraj's father, who is Jewish, he's an atheist, doesn't believe in anything, you're, died, you're dead, you're dead, that's it, that's, that's his beliefs. So he said to Giraj, he said, you already know what I think about the afterlife and spiritual, you know, you know what I feel. Giraj said, yes. He said, but I'll tell you one thing. He said, your teacher, Prabhupada, he said, he really knows how to deal with people. <laughs> and that for him was like the highest mm. honor that he could confer on a person. Mm. He knows how to deal with people. He's, uh, so he just thought, so whatever qualities and devotees say and all the reminiscences and the remembering and whatever qualities a person thinks is worth attaining or worth conserving or worth aspiring to people could see that quality in Srila Prabhupada in the highest aspect in the superlative they would see that in Srila so in Prabhupada's dealings, he, he was just so, people were just very, very impressed. Even people who, um, even people who, one devotee said, an Irish devotee, and his father was, he was 
London, he was a student, he gave up his studies, he became a devotee, he didn't tell his dad, and then after six months or so, he, oh, the dad was so angry, the whole, so he came and he was just Irish, you know, ready to fight, he was, to, and he just, where is this guy, I'm gonna, and uh, the devotees had him, uh, put him into Srila Prabhupada's room, um, he came out half an hour later and he was laughing. He said, ah, he's okay, that's, he said, you know, he's, he said, you guys are a bunch of idiots. He said, look at you. He said, but you know, he's, he's just, he just was, Prabhupada completely charmed him. He just completely, uh... so all of us are so very, very fortunate to have the shelter of Srila Prabhupada. Very, very fortunate. I came to India early, came in 1971. And there wasn't a lot going on. Uh, Srila Prabhupada came many times. And uh, there was a lot of interaction. Uh, so many stories, so many observances. And one time we were in uh, South India. And some pundits some from the Madhva Sampradaya, they came. And they came and we were having a program. And they said, who is Srila Prabhupada? We said, well, he was born in Calcutta. And they said, no, no, who is he? Who, who is Srila Prabhupada? We said, well, he's a sannyasi and he's in the head of ISKCON, the founder. No, no, who is he? And they were asking the question again and we were, they said, no, no, no. They said, Madhvacharya is an incarnation of Hanuman and Vayu. He said, but who is Srila Prabhupada? Is he Narad Muni? Is he, 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 he just, they just were in awe of what Srila Prabhupada was accomplishing. We had a traveling party. We had a traveling party. We were in South India with the Chutananda and uh, Yusodananda. They were in charge of the party. There was uh, Trinakarta and Dira Krishna and Riksi Raj and a few others. And we did a program in Udupi at the Madhva uh, Krishna Temple, the headquarters of the Madhva Sampradaya. And we played the Hare Krishna movie. This was maybe like 74. We played the Hare Krishna movie on a bed sheet, reel to reel. The lights came back on and people looked for Vidyaman Tirtha Maharaj to speak. And he is one of the eight sannyasis who are in a, a line from Madhvacharya. And um, he's very, very erudite. He has three PhDs in Sanskrit, different aspects, grammar, and different aspects of study. Highly intelligent, spoke eight languages. Um, no one from any other sampradaya would debate with him because he was just so sharp, so... The tradition there is that the sannyasi, who's the guru, a young boy is chosen to be the next guru and he gets trained like a prince. So there's the king and the prince. The prince is trained for the job of... That's the tradition, that's what they do. So they choose the young boy from the Gurukul. They got six, eight thousand kids in the Gurukul. So from different astrologically and different, they choose the boy and then he becomes. It's a great honor for the family. He's going to become the next Guru. And as soon as the old Guru dies, then immediately a junior is chosen for, for him. So the Guru trains his young protege. So as well as training his junior, there are seven other gurus. Three of the other gurus had given their junior to Vidyaman Tirtha Maharaj for also training because he was just so expert, so just an amazing, amazing devotee, wonderful qualities. He was a steer, he was knowledgeable, he just and a very, very amazing. He could speak to everyone in their own language. He was an amazing, amazing person. So he was the head man there, everyone acknowledged he was the senior person. So when the lights went out after showing the Hare Krishna, the Hare Krishna people, we showed it on a sheet, the lights went on, we 
He spoke. He said, He said, in the Ayurveda, the Ayurvedic Shastras, it is described that the subtle body extends one meter around the gross body. He said, this is explained in the Shastra. He said, within this meter, he said, we have a tendency to become affected by other people. He said, so if a person is particularly bad-natured, he said, we can feel this by them coming too close to us. He said, this is why we're very, very protective of our children, who comes near our children, and especially the young sannyasi. He said, we're very, very... And they have like a bodyguard around him. They have people just making a ring around him, like the President of the United States or Putin. And they're all chanting different mantras from different Vedas, from different... And, and they escort the young person around. He said, this is why, for example, he said, in the Smarta Brahmin community, he said, even if the shadow of a low-class person touches them, immediately they go and cleanse themselves and bathe and do their own ritual um, purification and so on, just for the shadow, because it, it, it's... He said, this is why we only preach in our own communities to the Brahmin families. And he said, this is why we could not ever entertain any thoughts of ever going overseas. He said, we would fall down. He said, it's just too many people, to, it's just too much bad influence. He said, we would fall down. So we don't even bother, we don't even try. He said, so when we see Bhaktivedanta Swami, who has gone to the West, and not only has he not fallen down, but he has made tens of thousands of people into Vaishnavas. He said, we do not understand what is the nature of this potency. It's not in the books. It is unknown to the highest scholars in our Sampradaya. The life, the activities, the preaching, the attainment of Śrīla Prabhupāda. It, he said, we do not understand what is the nature of this potency. And I went, wow! And I thought very quickly that there are, at the time, 650 million people in India. Approximately 40% are Vaishnavs, 40% Shivites, 20% Shakti. Um, you have three Sampradayas, he is, Madhva Sampradaya is very, very large. I did calculations and I came up with a figure that he is the spiritual leader of about 40 to 60 million people at the time. That was my just very quick calculation. A very, 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 very big, powerful man, very with, a, and he is saying that we do not understand what is, how Srila Prabhupada can do, he says, totally in awe of Srila Prabhupada. So, somehow or other, we can see the ISKCON, now there is 650 temples in ISKCON, today, 650 temples. It's just growing and growing. The bridge buses here in Brindavan, you speak to them, and they'll say, since my grandfather's time, since my great-grandfather's time, we have seen many sadhus in Vrindavan, many wonderful sadhus, doing so much nice bhajan, so much nice preaching, having so much love, real love for Krishna. And this becomes evident, and people become attracted. They come to listen to them, they come to follow them, to take advice and so on. He said, after some time, people organized to build a temple for the sadhu, for his teachings. He said in Vrindavan, he said, there are so many beautiful, wonderful temples. Beautiful, exquisite. I mean, you go down the Jaipur temple, I mean, beautiful temples, just really. And he said, but, he said, when, and so many today, Prem Mandir, beautiful, 
beautiful, beautiful buildings, beautiful temples. A lot of money, a lot of labor, a lot of love, a lot of respect for that guru giving those teachings of Krishna. He said, but in time, when the guru dies, he said, slowly, people drift away. He said, and now there are dozens, hundreds of temples in which there's an old pujari and some lady sweeps up, makes a little garland and it's just diminishing. They're doing the best they can, they're wonderful devotees, but it's a big place, they don't have the manpower, they don't have the... He said, this happens again and again and again. He said, so, when Srila Prabhupada died, again we expected the same thing. People will come for a few years and then just slowly it will just become another empty temple. He said, but to our surprise, he said, and never has happened before, he said, it's just growing, and there's more and more people, there's just more and more and more. It's, he said, we have never seen this phenomenon. So Srila Prabhupada is just so potent. So it's now 40 years, 40 years since Srila Prabhupada passed away. And not all of the disciples share the same views about different things. There are several issues in which various disciples disagree upon. And there's debates and so on about these different points. But even after 40 years, people are still arguing about Srila Prabhupada. It's like, you know, they're not coming to any consensus. But it's still, Prabhupada's very, very much alive in the heart of the devotees. Very, very much alive. So we're all very, very fortunate that uh, Srila Prabhupada came to the West, that he delivered us the teachings of uh, Lord Chaitanya. And Nandalal in 1975 in Los Angeles, this devotee woman, she wrote a letter to Srila Prabhupada. She said, Srila Prabhupada, she said, there is a sannyasi here and he is saying that when we give a book to someone, we are engaging them in Lord Chaitanya's Leela. And Lord Chaitanya, he is specifically engaging people in Nam Sankirtan so that they become eligible for entering into Krishna's pastimes. And this sannyasi is saying that what we do by giving a book to the member of the public is exactly the same thing is Radharani trying to engage the gopis in Krishna's service. Nandalal says, is it correct that he speaks like this? And Srila Prabhupada, ten days later, he sent a letter back and he, he said, he said, this is precisely correct. That with us engaging in Lord Chaitanya's Sankirtan movement, this is the exact same activity that Radharani is engaging the devotees in this. So, the reason I'm saying this is that when people come to Vrindavan, it can become very confusing. Very, very confusing. Because there are so many different people approaching Krishna in very, very different ways which gets back to my first statement, is that there is as many Krishnas as there are devotees, from that devotee's point of view. They read particular books, they emphasize particular rituals, there's particular verses, they have a particular way of approaching Krishna, so they have their own unique Krishna. And it becomes very confusing for devotees who come, because there's all, all of us, we want to advance in devotional service. All of us. This is why we're here. We bought a ticket. We paid. We shave our head. We wear a we, we, we do the whole, follow the program, because we want to love Krishna. And at times, we can be tempted to think, oh, this is a shortcut, or 
this is a better tune or this is a better but factually and any old devotee will tell you the same thing again and again factually the best the most efficient the most effective way of becoming established in devotional service making advancement in devotional service having the determination to continue to advance in devotional service is 100% following Srila Prabhupada's program. There are no shortcuts. There are no other spiritual teachers who are teaching more than Srila Prabhupada taught, who are teaching it better than Srila Prabhupada taught, who have a higher understanding, who have a... The disciples will say that. Of course they do. Oh, we're doing this, we're doing that. You know, the disciple will praise his teacher. But from the point of view of the big, big scholars, like Vidyaman Tirtha Maharaj, people who are very, very established, who have millions of followers, from the point of view of these people, no one exceeds Srila Prabhupada. Absolutely no one. So all of us here, the best thing that we can ever do is to follow Srila Prabhupada's teachings, to read his books, to chant faithfully, to, and to engage in book distribution and Harinam. So these devotees, Vishwamitra Prabhu was traveling in buses, famous all over America, Ramadamadar part, Radhadamadar part, Bhutatma Prabhu, the very, very first very first traveling party, traveling in a vehicle, washing with a bucket, just they had the idea, let's, let's try and do this. Very, very, very caught on, just spread all over the world. And then spent so many years of his life, he's a very highly intelligent, very educated man, spent so many years of his life editing Srila Prabhupada's books, editing his books, making small books, compiling, just so people could get the message of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, and by this, invoking the mercy of Krishna, so that we can join Krishna in his lila, in the spiritual world. So this is what we all, we, we, we all like this idea of being with Krishna, of engaging with Krishna. It can be done. It can be done by following Srila Prabhupada's program, engaging in following the program, following the discipline, exactly as Srila Prabhupada advised us, to engage in book distribution, to engage in Harinam, and then by the mercy of Krishna, at some point we will be invited to participate in Krishna's Leela. It's not somehow or other we can storm the gates, we can demand to get in. We, it, this is foolishness, and it's not ever going to happen. Srila Prabhupada was wonderful, he's amazing, and somehow or other we're all so, so fortunate to be here in Srila Prabhupada's house, here in Vrindavan, here at this time, just in time for evening arti. Srila Prabhupada ki! Jai. Jai.